Hello again. Today we are going to start a new topic about the concept of planar graphs, which is about the drawing of graphs inside a plane. The only condition is that there must not be any overlapping edges. So just as a reminder uh, that in geometrical terms, a plane is considered as a flat or two dimensional surface. So as an intuition, you may consider it to be drawing a graph on a piece of paper or for that matter a circuit board or a blackboard or even a city. Also please note that when we draw a graph structure we basically see sets of vertices and sets of edges. It's all about how everything is interconnected with one another. So drawing an edge like uh, perhaps this or this is meaningless because in both cases you are signifying that the edge is connecting two vertices with one another. So this is not a problem when we look at it from the perspective of graph theory. But when we are talking about the concept of planar graphs, then in that case some particular types of drawings may be problematic. So as an example, uh, if we take the case of um, uh, K2, K3 and K4, we can see K2 as this graph, K3 as this triangle shape and K4 can be drawn like this. Now, in all of these cases, if we imagine that there is a plane represented by this box what we can see over here is that if we move either of these graphs into the plane, we can basically see that there are no intersecting edges. But when we take the case of K4, the way in which this graph is drawn is actually problematic. So although from a graph perspective, we really see that uh, the diagonals are represented as uh, AD and BC, okay? And of course, there are some other edges. So these are the diagonals. This There is no information over here which show that they are overlapping. Okay, so as far as the data structure is concerned, we don't have that information. But when we look at it pictorially, we can see that there is an overlap over here. But suppose, we do not draw it in this way, but rather we draw it in this manner. So I'll put it out once and let's suppose we draw the K4 graph in this manner where we have, um, okay, so just watch. Okay, and like this. So really drawing a graph of K4 in this manner and drawing it in this manner, it doesn't make any difference from a data structure point of view. They are the same. But if you consider this version, we can see that there are no edges intersecting with one another. So from this perspective, we can say that the graph is basically planar. And although we may draw it in this perspective, um, this would be this would be uh, incorrect to represent it in this way because of some properties which we will see later on. So, the general idea is that in the case of a planar graph, um, we have a kind of a geometrical representation such that we can draw the graph entirely in a plane where no two of its edges intersect with one another. Okay, so let's look at some theorems pertaining to this. The first theorem is that K5 is non-planar. Now, please note that we have started this discussion with the perspective of K2, K3, K4. And although K4 could have a problematic representation, in general, we can draw K4 in such a way that uh, uh, it can be becoming it can become planar so let's have a look at k5 as a as an additional case so let me erase this part 
Okay, so in the case of K5, so as you can see, there are plenty of lines which are overlapping with one another. But if you recall, uh, we also saw that in the K4 graph, we also saw that there were two edges which were overlapping with one another, but we could redraw it in a different way such that this would become planar. So, although we can see that there are a similar, in a similar way, we can see that there are overlapping edges. Is it possible to reorient the edges of K5 just like that of K4 such that we can say that there are no overlapping edges? So let's see if we can draw K5 in a different way. Um, we can start with just drawing a boundary. And from this, let's, let's consider the case of uh, vertex 1. Vertex 1 is connected to everybody else. So we can basically say that uh, we can start drawing edges. And so far, you can notice that there are no overlaps which has taken place while drawing this part of the graph. Now if you move towards 2, you can notice that if we start drawing an edge from 2 to 4 and we start with this direction, we reach to a barrier. But if you go in this direction, we don't have any barrier at all and we can reach to vertex 4 if you go out of the plane, uh, out of the object. So we can come about to drawing a, an edge in this regards. Then in a similar manner, we can connect two with five. So it's not possible to move from in, the inside region of two, but it's perfectly possible to move to the outside region to and ultimately we will come to the region of, uh, to the vertex of five. When we come to the case of three to five, so remember that the only vertices which you can say that they are now left behind, like the, the degree of all of these vertex is 4, 4, 4. And the degree of vertex 3 and 5 is 3. But if we were to draw this line, then in that case, we have a K5. But this is not possible because if we, if we take into account that we have to move from 3 in this direction, we reach a barrier. And if we move from 3 in this direction, we also meet a barrier. So in that regards, we can now see that the graph cannot be drawn in any in a way in which the edges do not overlap with one another. So as far as K4 is concerned, K4 is planar. And as far as K5 is concerned, K5 is not planar. But if we consider this graph, okay, um, if we just do K5 minus the edge 3, 5, in that case, this subgraph will become planar also. And it's not just 3, 5. This is, this is 3, 5 because it was the way we drew this algorithm. Okay, it can be anything. So basically, if we remove any edge from K5, it will become planar. And from this intuition, we can then say that if K5 is not planar, then that would imply that all these graphs, K6, K7, K8, and so on and so forth, they must not be planar as well. So the minimum non-planar graph with the minimum number of vertices is K5. Then as far as K4 and K3, K2, K1 is concerned, they are planar. In a similar way, uh, we can also notice that there may be other types of graphs. So we can look at another example. Uh, this is the uh, K33 graph. So this is basically a bijection of three vertices and uh, three vertices in another set. So it's called a bijection because um, in this case, we say that 
uh, vertices belonging to a single set are not connected with one another but they are connected with everybody else likewise vertices belonging to this set they will be not connected amongst themselves but they will be connected to everybody else so um, that's that's why it's called a bijection now since this is a full connectivity we can also consider something like this that if we represent full connectivity we really mean that there are edges going from this part to this part and you can see a full connectivity and likewise from this part to this part so this is basically a, a k33 graph now is this graph planar the theorem says not but why maybe we can try to draw it so in this case what i can do is that i will try to redraw it so these are my vertices and initially what i can do is that i can simply draw these straight lines like this so as far as one is con concerned it's connected to everybody else now if we look at the drawing of two with all of these you can notice that we can only draw a straight line from two to six but the line from two to four will not be straight we can draw it like this and what about two to five it can be done in a similar way we can draw it in a curved way such that it can come to this representation then when we come to the case of three again we can see that uh, three can be joined with six via a straight line but if we draw a line uh, an edge from three to five we will be needing to apply a kind of a curvature and now if you want to draw from 3 to 4 you can notice that we can have the option of moving in this direction but you can see that this region is blocked so you can see here that we can identify some kind of regions in this case okay so actually there is a very interesting link between regions or what are known as faces and the concept of planar graph and if we want to draw a line from 3 to 4 we only have an option of going through region C or going through region D okay so the only ways are C and D but if you come over here you can see that the regions which are adjacent to this are A and B and none of these overlap with the regions coinciding over here so as a result the line from 3 to 4 is not possible so we can basically say from this that the k33 graph is also not non-planar but if we remove just one edge and in this case we can see that that one edge is 3 4 but it depended upon how we drew the graph if we have another arrangement of drawing this graph we can identify any edge any one edge if we remove that from the k33 it will become planar so in that sense we are basically saying k33 minus any edge okay that is going to become planar so both of these properties uh, k5 and k33 graph that they are non-planar they are actually described in the kuratowski's theorem so if we can have any complicated graph structure if there is a subset of this graph which is either a k5 or a k3 so it doesn't matter which one but if there is a subset which is either of these two then 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 in that case we can say that this graph is also not planar okay so we move ahead and refer to the concept of the term regions so we saw what the region is represented over here uh, when we draw a graph we can also identify regions in this case so here the regions could be a b c d e and f notice that i'm drawing i'm considering f as a region also so if if we consider that this is an embedding in a plane
So this F is a region. And likewise, we also had the concept of D uh, over here, which represented that it's uh, a region at the boundary. With the concept of region, please note that if we represent the graph K4, K4 in this manner has no regions. So it's wrong to say that this is region A, B, C, D and E. That's incorrect. But if you draw K4 in this manner, then in that case it has regions. This is incorrect. So the regions in this case are going to be A, B, C and D. Okay, so now we consider a case where we can draw a graph in a surface of a sphere rather than plane. So there is actually no difference between drawing a graph on a surface or drawing a graph on a plane. So basically if we consider a case where we have a plane and we consider a sphere which is lying on top of this plane and we consider a point we can call this as the southernmost point so that this can be SP and there can be a, a northernmost point so we can call this as NP and of course this is going to be a straight line represented by L. Now L is basically perpendicular to the plane. Now if we consider any point P on the plane and we draw a straight line from this plane to the point NP, this can be any point on the plane. Okay, so there are an infinite amount of possibilities. In all of those cases, if you are going to draw something, there will be only one intersecting point on the sphere as a result of it being a straight line. And as a result, we can then say that if this is the representation of a plane and we consider all the points inside this plane, really each and every one of them will have a single intersecting point if they were to be drawn on the sphere. Hence, if something is planar and it can be drawn, so if, if a graph is planar and it can be drawn inside a plane, in a similar way, we can draw a planar graph on a sphere also. Of course, the only exception to this would be the case where P is at infinity. And in that case, we will have the corresponding point on the sphere as equivalent to NP. Okay, so now we have a look at the so-called Euler's formula which uh, gives to us the total number of regions in a graph given some vertices and edges in a connected planar graph. And why does this relationship hold? Well, there are multiple reasons for that. So we saw in the last few slides. So in this case, the different regions are surrounded by three edges. So we can identify A, B, C, D, E and F and in these cases we have 6 regions multiplied by 3 edges each which is equal to 18. And if you look at the degrees 3, 7, 11, 14 and 18. So there is a, there is a relationship between this quantity and the total degrees which is also equal to 80. If we take into account the K33 graph, here we can identify four regions and each of the region is surrounded by four edges which comes to a quantity 16 and if you count the total degrees that turns out to be 2, 5, 8, 11, 14 and 16. So again we see that there is a relationship between the regions and the total number of degrees in a graph. So in other words we can write that the total degree of the graph is equal to 
the number of regions of size 3 surrounded by 3 edges plus the number of regions of size 4 surrounded by 4 edges plus the number of regions of size 5 surrounded by 5 edges and so on and so forth. Likewise, we can say the total number of regions in the graph itself that is equal to the number of regions of size 3 plus the number of regions of size 4 plus the number of regions of size 5 and so on and so forth. Please note that in these cases we are not taking into account vertices of size 2 because no region is formed as a, on the basis of that. And considering the well-known expression for a p-sided polygon such that if you want to find out the total number of angles of this polygon, we can express it at the sum of interior angles and the exterior angles. So please note that the sum of the exterior angles of any polygon is always 2 pi. And if we take into account the sum of the interior angles of the polygon, we will have pi p minus 2, where p is the length of the polygon. So if you want to find out the total angles in the graph, we can construct an expression for the sum of the exterior angle as well as the sum of the interior angles of the different sized polygon regions in the graph. Thus we can obtain pi 3 minus 2 r3 for polygons of length 3 plus pi 4 minus 2 r4 for polygons of length 4 and so on and so forth until we have pi r minus 2 for polygons of length r and of course taking into account the exterior angles we get the expression for the total angles and of course we if we expand this we are going to get some terms like pi 3 r 3 minus pi 2 r 3 plus pi 4 r 4 minus pi 2 r 4 and so on and so forth and at the end we have plus 4 pi and this can be simplified on the basis of equation 1 and 2 if you notice some parts of the expression like pi r3, 4 r4 and so on and so forth, they are actually constituting the total degree of the graph as given in equation 1. And if you take into account just the terms r3, r4 and so on and so forth, that re refers to the total number of regions of a graph. So we can rewrite equation 3 in the form of pi 2e minus 2f plus 4 pi and since the total number of angles must equal equate to 2, 2 pi of n we can simply solve for this expression so just for simplification what we can do is to open this up to get pi to e minus 2 pi f plus 4 pi is equal to 2 pi n and the 2 pi's are going to be cancelled out this is going to become 2, we get e minus f plus 2 is equal to n, which if we can rewrite it in other ways, we can get this expression. So given some edges and vertices in the graph, we can easily find out the total regions for the graph. And this can also be solved by means of induction. So we can actually rewrite the Euler's formula as n minus e plus f is equal to 2. And suppose we start an induction where n is equal to 1, vertex only. Well, here we have n as 1, edges as 0, and regions as 1, which satisfies the formula. And if we keep on adding one edge to this graph, we still have n is equal to 1. Now we have one edge and two regions. So here the first region is inside the loop and the second region is outside the loop. So again this satisfies the formula as well. If we add one more edge to it, well we still have one vertice. This time we have two edges and three regions. 
So again, if you plug them into the formula, the formula holds for all of the cases. So for n is equal to 1, the formula is correct. And now if we consider the case of n is equal to 2 or greater, we can consider a simplification in the form of a contraction where really if we take into account that we have an edge like this, we can contract it into a single vertex. In both cases, there is no change in the total number of regions. So suppose we take into account the case of n is equal to 3, considering rect a triangle, in this case n is equal to 3, the total number of edges is equal to 3, and the regions are 2. Now suppose we want to identify an edge and we contract it. So let's suppose we take into account the bottom edge. If we are going to collapse it to a point, that would imply that this is going to become a graph where we have two edges and two vertices and we still we still have two regions. Now we can identify the contracted number of vertices as n bar, the contracted uh, and the resulting, the resulting edges as e bar and the total number of regions as f bar. So while this held true, n minus e plus f is equal to 2, we know that n can be written as n bar plus 1 and e can be written as e bar plus 1 and there is no change in f so we can simply write f bar that is equal to 2. So in other words if you open up the brackets the, the plus 1 and minus 1 is going to be cancelled with each other and thus we can also write n bar minus e bar plus f bar is equal to 2. So the induction also holds for the case of n is greater than or equal to 2. Okay. So next up we can have a look at some estimates like e is less than or equal to 3 and minus 6 or e is less than or equal to 2 and minus 4 which present to us some conditions and if these conditions are true then we may conclude that a graph is planar. So on the basis of Kurotowski's theorem you may recall that determining whether a graph is planar or not depends on whether we can find the k5 or the k33 subgraphs. So in the case of k5, it is similar to finding clicks of size 5. And a similar convention can be followed for finding the k33 bijection. So this is a complex problem to solve. So in this case, some estimates are helpful rather than run complex algorithms. So there are multiple ways to do it. We will only be looking at cases where the smallest region is bounded by uh, a size of 3 or 4 edges. So in the first case, considering that n is greater than or equal to 3, we are looking to satisfy the first condition that the graph does not contain a k5. So in that regards, the condition is basically e is less than or equal to 3n minus 6. Now since in the k5 the smallest region is bounded by a triangle and we already know that it satisfies the criteria that the total number of degrees of the graph is less than or equal to the number of faces bounded by three edges and since we can now plug in the expression of f we get 2e is less than or equal to 3e minus n plus 2 and opening this up we can get 2e minus 3e on the left hand side and minus 3n plus 6 on the right hand side. So this gives us minus e less than or equal to minus 3n plus 6 or e is less than or equal to 3n minus 6. In a similar way if we now satisfy n is greater than or equal to 3 for the k3 3 subgraph we have the expression e is less than or equal to 2n minus 4. So again if you recall that the smallest region in the k3 3 graph is bounded by 4 edges. So in that case we already know that 2 e is, is less than or equal to 4f and following the same convention we can plug in 2e 
is less than equal to 4 e minus n plus 2 again bringing 4 to the right hand side we get minus 2 e is less than equal to minus 4 n plus 8 or in other words we can get simply e is less than equal to 2 n minus 4. So we can follow the same procedure to determine expressions which are true for any smallest sized constituent polygon of a graph and that can be done by simply looking for the expression 2 is, is less than equal to rf where r is the size of the polygon. Okay so now we come to this theorem for actually drawing a graph actually a planar graph using straight lines. So remember when we said that if you consider that a edge is shaped like this, this is basically the same as drawing an edge like this. And if you consider the cases of K33, if you look at the K33 minus a single edge case, you can see that there are plenty of curved edges. And likewise in the case of the K5 graph also, K5 minus one edge, you can see plenty of curved edges. And the point is that if we try to straighten up the edges, the, will the edges in the graph become overlapping again? Well, according to this theorem, it says that it shouldn't. It's just that when rearranging the edges, we also have to reposition the vertices. So the, in the case of the K5 minus edge graph, we can here refer to the point that 5 and 3 are not connected to one another. That means that 5 and 3 can be left to be non-adjacent to one another. So considering that the vertex 3 is connected to 2, 1, 4, we can really rearrange this into something like this. And drawing straight lines from 3 to all of these terms gives us this representation. Moving to the case of 2, 2 is connected to everybody, so it's already connected to 3, we can make a connection to 1 and to 4 and to 5. Then moving on to 4, it's also connected to everybody. So in this case we can draw a line between 5 and 4, 2, 4 and 3, 4 is already there and we can have 1, 4 over here. And in the case of vertex 5, 5 is connected to 1, 4 and 2. So 2 and 4 are already here, we can just plug in 1 over here as well. And if you come to 1, 1 is connected to everybody else. So if you notice, we have straight lines. A similar logic can be applied to the case of the K33 graph. So in this case, we can start with 1 and put it in an extreme. So we can have 1 which is connected to 4, 5 and 6. So in no order we can just simply write 4, 5 and 6 and of course 1 is connected to all of them. And we can take the case of 2. 2 is also connected to both 4, 5, 6. So plugging in 2 over here. In the case of 3 it is only linked with 5 and 6 so we can plug in 3 somewhere in between. If you come to 4, 4 is linked with 1 and 2 only, which is true. If we take the case of 5, it's linked with 1, 2 and 3. Yes, that is correct. If we take the case of 6, it's also linked with 1, 2 and 3. So in this case, we can again see that the K33 graph has also been represented on the basis of a straight line. All it required was to change some positions of the vertices. So the next topic which is really a kind of a, a property or a feature of a graph known as thickness. So recall taking in the case of the, the K5 graph, we were not actually able to draw an edge between 3 and 5 in the plane. And the behavior of this is that if we cannot draw it in plane, then we must be able to draw it out of. And the conventional approach would be a mechanism where you can, if, if this was a circuit board, you can say that, okay, we cannot join three and five by a, an electric wire. We can simply solder a wire from three to five. 
where it is jumping out of the circuit board. That, that concept is actually translated in graphs to multiple planes where it still contains the same number of vertices. Both planes are stacked on top of one another and the edge which could not be placed inside plane 0, it can be placed inside P1 where we simply have a line or an edge between 3 and 5. Now please note that there is multiple room inside P1 where we can add additional edges to the graph. But there may be a point again where the P1 is also populated to the extent that it is no longer individually planar. So in that case we may need a third layer or a fourth layer or a fifth layer and so on and so forth. So this stacking up together of different layers is known as the thickness of a graph. So given any graph, is it possible we find out the thickness of this graph? Well, there are expressions for that. So in general, we know already that K5 has a thickness of 2, K33 has a thickness of 2. You can do this as an exercise, but even K6 has a thickness of 2. Please note that there is sufficient room inside the second plane of K6 to accommodate most of the edges. And if we keep on going further, it's actually at K9 where you start to see a thickness of 3 emerging. So, but these are complete graphs. What about arbitrary graphs? That is actually quite a complex problem. So, most of the thicknesses are applied to families of graphs. For Kn, this is the expression. For Km, n, this is the expression. For the case of hypercubes, we have n plus 1 divided by 4, and so on and so forth. For arbitrary graphs, if the expression is not known, then we can devise some kind of algorithm to help us make an estimate. The algorithm works by cleaning a graph a little bit, such that we have to remove self loops and parallel edges and also perform contractions like this or like this. And so once we arrive with a reduced graph which has these properties and inside these properties if you want to find out the planarity conditions, in that case you can apply these processes. So as an example if we take a graph like this, we have to keep on running iterations across the different components. So in the first case, what will happen is the removal of the self loop. In the second case, we can have a removal of a parallel edge. There still exists one more parallel edge, then followed by a contraction, then removal of a parallel edge, and then no further reductions are possible. So if you take into account this refers to the first expression, which says that it will return a single edge which is planar. Now please note that this planarity deduction algorithm is not guaranteed to work. It's really quite a difficult problem to determine the planarity. And when we are playing with the reduction or the simplification procedure of a graph, we may come into some cases where we arise with homeomorphic graphs. So we say that two graphs G1 and G2 are homeomorphic graphs if either of these conditions are present. So as an example, we can say that a graph like this is homeomorphic to G2. A graph like this would be homeomorphic to G2 and so on and so forth. So coming to the next topic, we now look at the concept of a geometric dual. So geometric dual is basically a graph identified by the symbol G star and we say that it's constructed actually or rather you can say transformed from a graph G. How does this happen? Well, some properties are there. So for example, the in the case of G, the faces inside a graph G are going to be converted into vertices in G star. And of course, since we are talking about faces, that would imply that 
the concept of geometric dual is going to be possible to acquire if g is planar so we can have a condition if g is equal to is equal to planar so there are also some other properties so for example if a vertices have in g they will be transformed into pendant vertices in g star if there are edges in series they will become parallel if there are parallel edges in g they will become series edges in g star so let's have a look at some examples suppose we are taking into account a graph g we can actually construct g star we can plug in the faces of g so let's call this as a b c and d so please note that over here as per definition edges which are separating regions in g will have to become edges in east in g star so in this case what we will have this edge is going to be normal to the two regions a and b the similar convention can be applied for the edge between region b and c and the edge between region a and c now you can refer that most of these properties are vice versa as well taking into account these two likewise if we take the case of loops it will become pendants and the pendants will become loops and likewise if we take the case of faces will become vertices we can say that the vertices can becomes can become faces so since we can see a pendant vertex in g we can basically convert it into a loop so it's basically an edge from region a to a in terms of the region d and c we can also place an edge actually let me bring this d to the other part so we can place an edge between c and d because of this particular edge we can place an edge between b and d we can place another parallel edge between b and d we can place an edge between a and d and that's it so basically the g star which we have acquired so the transformation using these properties results in a graph g star and we can actually simplify the edges over here to simply represent a connection between a and d now this will have plenty of usage when we come to the topic of coloring of a graph but basically because of these properties we can say that if we take the geometric dual of a geometric dual in other words if we take g star is the geometric dual and if we take a geometric dual of this again both of these are going to be isomorphic we have already addressed this theorem that a geometric dual will only exist if a graph does not have either k5 or k33 components and it is planar okay so that brings us to the end of the topic of planarity see you in the next class for coloring thank you very much